Welcome to the For Fox Sake podcast, by the fans, for the fans. With all the news, views and discussion from two lifelong Leicester City supporters. It's your show, so get in contact, make yourselves heard, what's your opinion? The only Leicester City podcast that's by the fans, for the fans. This is for Fox sake. Hello and welcome to For Fox sake. My name is Pete Selby and alongside me, once again, it's Mr. Rob Hayes. For the 61st time, bar- barring a couple. Yes, episode 61. Well, I've not been here for one, maybe one. Have you done them all? No, I missed I missed that one when I went on holiday and I left you to your own devices with JMO. That was a dark day. That was a bad day. Yeah. Bad episode that was. You had a, a plastic forest fan who's actually a Liverpool fan. Horrendous. I mean, what a combination that is. I think um, Dave has done one as well. Dave Rogers, he was here for... Uh, yeah, a long time ago. That was a long he's, time ago. He's a London type now, so he doesn't really like Leicester. He's part of the... Uh, he's the... a United fan from Wales who lives in London. He's part of the, the hipster crew now, isn't he? Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, he's one of them that wear, that gets his ankles out. Yes. You know, where he's wearing jeans and doesn't wear socks with his trainers. Yes, and he goes to... Free like, the ankle, free the soul, I believe, is his new mantra. He goes to, like, celery sandwich bars and stuff like that, yeah. and uh, he hosts, like, open mic night with no microphones and lights. Yeah, drinks a load of gin. Yes, that's Posh gin. Um, Hi, Dave, anyway. Uh, yes, hello. Hope, hope you're listening. Uh, right. Liverpool. Liverpool, that's right. So, since... Uh, i tell you what, it's a boring club, isn't it? Nothing really happens. Nah. Um, Following Leicester must be such a drag for us, eh? I've said it a few times in the last seven days or so. I've said to people... Uh, who support other clubs, and um, you know that's that's fair. they're allowed to. Do you know what I mean? But um, I've said if to them, must. yeah, I said to them, uh, you know, it must be really boring supporting, you know, whoever like the Ro- Rochdale or you know your um, your Yeovils or whatever. Yes, they're all going for their own trophies and their own highs and lows and this that, and the other. But apart from you know one or two that come to mind, Leicester in the last okay, you know, last year and everything, but. There's always there's always something, and I think we've said before on the podcast before seasons have started that we quite like just a mid table. I think that was this season, wasn't it? You know, a we'd, nice we'd like a bit of a rest. rest. Just you know, be be fine in the Premier League, no worries, and then in the cup competitions, then we can have a laugh and really go for it. But uh, you know, the league form takes care of itself. You know, you win some, you lose some, you finish tenth. Um, but that's not happened. Of as course, we all know. it's not. No, of course not. Um, so, I've got a question for you before we before we get into a football. Football, right, right, right. Monday night's performance. Yes, was that? I'll give you three options here. All good. Was that performance for Claudio Ranieri? Was that performance for the players' own personal pride, or was that performance for Craig Shakespeare? In the humble opinion of Pete Selby, sports fan. I think it's probably a combination of all three, which is a real cop out. But I have to go for one, don't I? Yeah. What? Which? Which of the? If it's a combination of the three, which? Which? Which ingredient are you putting the most of in? Oh, okay. I will say it was first of all for the players. I think, um, in my opinion, I would then say it's very close between Shakespeare and Ranieri. I think that you'd say. It was possibly for Ranieri just ahead of Shakespeare and only because, and again, we don't know, but um, Ranieri going to the training ground, meeting the players and all that sort of thing, there has to be a tinge, well, not even a tinge, uh, a bit of guilt there. The yeah, readers. Any, and, any human being would exactly. feel that, wouldn't they? they and I, and yeah. I think also the banners in the ground and um, and also I think the, the, the reception the players got from the fans, which we'll come on to uh, shortly, you know, the there was no animosity at all. It was no. purely get behind the team, behind the players, behind the club. Um, and I think they must have looked around and first of all gone a as they all know what a great club we have. But um, also maybe it was our fault with Ranieri, and you know this wins for him. Even though, and obviously Shakespeare, they're all fully behind and 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 really get on with. But uh, yeah, I mean very close between A and C on your on your question. Um, Okay, I'll ask you a question, actually. Go on, then. Um, If you had the option right now of recording, um, of employing... And again, we'll come on to this in more detail later. Employing Craig Shakespeare right now to the end of the season, no matter what happens from now until the end of the season, 
Would you do that right now, yes or no? Right at this particular second, yes. on this sunny Thursday afternoon? Yes. No, I'd wait till Saturday. Well, well interesting. Because, interesting. Purely because I think after Saturday, and obviously two games doesn't really give you a huge amount of of uh, reasoning to work with, but it gives you double the amount of reasoning to work with than one game. After Monday? Yeah. Do I think we'll have more of an idea... Oh, after Saturday with uh, after Saturday Hull. against Hull, right? Yeah, I corrected you incorrectly, and then you yeah. corrected my incorrect. We're in the correction. right track. Yeah. So I'm saying after Saturday, we will have more of an idea of what sparked that reaction against Liverpool on Monday. If it's the Craig Shakespeare effect, then it will carry on against Hull. If yes. it was the for Claudio effect, you'd, you'd think it would really only <laughs> they'll roll over. <laughs> yeah, you'd think it would only last one game, really. Yes. Uh, if it was for the players. They basically, some of them might look look at that and say, look, well, we proved in that 90 minutes what we can do. So I think if it is Craig Shakespeare and if it's his influence that will save us at the end of the season, I think we'll be able to know more about that at the end of the 90 minutes against Hull. He, was, had, a, he had a meeting yesterday with the owners, uh, so it was reported, I think to say, look, you've got it until Saturday and then we'll discuss it again. Well, like you said, there's a lot of time after Saturday, isn't there? Well, there is in the league sense. Yeah, apart from um, the, the, the small oh, no, 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 matter no, no, of the there Champions is, League. There is then a gap, isn't there? Off the top of my head, after Saturday's performance against Hull, we then will play next against Seville. I mean, this we should have this sorted out. Should, shouldn't we? Yes. But Seville is not until a week on Wednesday. 14th? Yes. Yeah. So there is a full week and a half gap then. Between the game against Hull and then Seville. So there's a good 14 days, two weeks for the next Premier League game away at West Ham. That's a long time in between games, which I know sounds silly, but it is in terms of the managing decisions. So he's obviously been told, look, you've got the game on Saturday against Hull and then we'll readdress the situation after that because there's plenty of time to then get something sorted. Um, Right, we better start talking about the Liverpool game now. Obviously, there's many questions surrounding the game, and I think we'll come on to them in a bit. We'll just concentrate on the game itself. So, the lineup that Shakespeare went with it was exactly the same as the title winning team, but with Ndidi in midfield instead of Kante. Ndidi's well, quality, by the way. Exactly. I mean, end of the day, he was just like a, a stretched out Kante, wasn't he? Yeah. And there was that mad stat that he made more tackles than Kante did in one game, which I know is, is stats and stats, aren't they? Um, one thing about a stat, they kept on showing on Sky Sports News regarding Jamie Vardy making more sprints than ever before. Yes, but he made 71 in one game, and they said, look, that's a lot more than this previous game and there was 64 and I went oh hang on that's not actually an awful lot more <laughs> no on you balance know, that's you know it's, it's it's about 10% just under 10% so yes okay it is more but you know, it's, it's hardly a massive difference but anyway um he went with the same team and basically just went look lads go back to basics and also apparently the players had some inputs end of the day you've got yeah Shakespeare you, asked them didn't he, he said how 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 are we going to beat Liverpool yeah, you got three days to prepare for a game. And the best thing you could do is, is have a word with the players and say, look, you've all just won the league. You're all experienced players. You know what to do. You know the way that we like to play. Let's go and do it this way. Do you agree? And obviously the the, the comeback was, yes, let's go for it this way. And uh, and that's that's quite good. And obviously the feedback from that, you know, in the national press has been player power and all that. But uh, if they play like they did, then more to it but uh, a great victory to be honest it could have just been like last season it was just missing a 40 yard volley wasn't it really Liverpool well, Drinkwater did his best he, he did his best but he they, was they, a little bit closer but they started so quickly Leicester and they were pressing they were harrying they were hustling uh, great atmosphere yeah that I think that got the crowd on side because if there was any doubt over the crowd's loyalty whether it was going to be to Ranieri or to the players and if they were going to trust what the tabloids in particular were printing if Leicester had started sluggishly or Liverpool had started well, I think there'd have been a few, the, the gripes would have been a bit louder. But the fact that Leicester started positively and pressed a lot got the crowd on their side from the first minute. Yes, and they were pressing a lot higher up the field than they have been recently and maybe towards the end of last season instead of waiting for Liverpool to come back in their own half. This is in the first half especially. And um, they were hunting down in packs. You had the likes of Albrighton and, and Mares and also Vardy up top with Okazaki, uh, who played, has to be his best game of the season by a distance, Okazaki. And... Um, 
and it was it was it was great. It was the Leicester of old. It was just like we we like to see Leicester, uncomplicated, really, just going for the jugular. Sometimes not the prettiest football in the world. Who but cares? Exactly. It's effective. Ex- it's very effective. Exactly. And this is what other people hate. And this is what you know. This is what Leicester fans like because they like that other people don't like the way we play. And yet I find it exciting, entertaining. Yeah. And um, for some reason, some people don't like that. But um, first goal. Jamie Vardy, who had a couple of chances before that, snatched a couple, one left-footed volley, which he should have scored from. Okazaki had a header. And um, Liverpool, yes, they looked dangerous going forward, but then a great through ball by Mark Albright and Vardy on the last man. That Liverpool defence, though. Yeah. What's his name? Who? Matip? Matt Matt Lip. Matip. Matt, Matt Matt Lucas was worse. I I said to so I, you weren't on commentary for that game. Were you? I was I was in the in the commentary box with. Stephen Jameson, who has hosted the previous edition of Liverpool Fox fan it. Stephen Jameson. Yeah. Uh, who doesn't listen, actually, to the podcast, can, so we can, can, we can say whatever we want about it. You can him. guess how he got on the rotor for the, for yeah. the Leicester commentary, can't you? Twisted my arm. Uh, I said to him before the game, how are you going to win this game with only two defenders? Yeah. They've got Matip and they've got Klein. That's it. Lucas is a central midfielder who is nowhere near as good as Mascherano, but has been tried to be turned into a a defensive midfielder that's been moved back to centre half and is slow and weak as. and small James Milner he can play left back every day for a, an entire season and still not be a left back mm. can't you he d- so I said to him look you've got Matip you've got Klein and you've got that shambles between the sticks the if, f- you, if you were playing anybody half decent they'd tear you apart here but then apparently Leicester turned up and were half decent but Lucas honestly was it was we, you know what we haven't done for a while? What's best and worst 11. Best, well, the best and worst 11 <laughs> has uh, has gone out the window for this season. We'll have to bring it back for next season. Um, it, we'll, Lucas yeah. would be in it. The thing is with them, the last team who did that, who played such a high line against Leicester and also played players out of position, was Man City. And yeah. we know what happened and there. And they got picked off. And this was very similar. A lovely through ball by Albright and first time for Vardy. And he's clean on goal. And, and I will say the goal, goal, goalkeeper made his mind up, really. Just knock it down the near post, job done goal. I still it, thought he was going to miss it. Well, because, think, because of the, he's not scoring goals. That's true, but he showed a lot of composure. I think and so, he was yeah. very calm. He didn't snatch at it, he didn't blast it, although that is his style. Um, but I do think the goalkeeper showed him the way to go. And again, he, he, he collapsed on the floor. You know how Schmeichel comes out, Schmeichel-esque, you know, yeah. spreads himself. Some goalkeepers like to stand tall, um, thinking of the likes of De Gea. And um, and maybe the taller goalkeepers like Forster, but um, but no, Mignolet did that kind of. I'm going to jump on the floor and not spread myself at all. It, it, terrible keeping, and he continued that vein all the way through the game, really. Yeah, but still, Vardy one on one with all the pressure, all the hype, Leicester in the relegation zone, massive amount of pressure, huge amount of pressure on that chance, and an awful lot of time as well, which is worse sometimes. Yes, and yeah, yeah, time to think about it. Yeah, can't finish and. The crowd from going from a 7 out of 10, 8 out of 10 in noise level, went to a 10. Yeah. And it, it settled the team down. They stopped, um, I want to say pressing in a headless chicken sense. But that's what they were doing, in my opinion, in the first 20 minutes or so. Um, and as soon as that goal went in, they then calmed down slightly, but still pressed, but a bit more pragmatically, a bit, a bit with a bit more purpose and, yeah. and thought about it. And when a player, for example, got caught on their own touchline, for example, then they went and attacked and, and, and really pressurised the player um, in, in a pack rather than just do it willy-nilly across the field. Because in them first quarter of an hour or so, they did that and at some points were quite stretched towards the back. Um, and then the second goal came and a lovely volley by Danny Drinkwater, who finish. doesn't do it more, he should do it more often. A player, his skill, when we've said before, should score more. But when he does hit them from distance, they can go in. They can, and they did. That was, you, you said it was missing a 40 yard volley for, uh, from the same match last season, but Drinkwater must have been 25 yards at least. It's a good hit as well, because as soon as it came out to him on the edge of the box, I thought, don't hit it, don't hit it, because it was coming from what looked like too high at him. It had bounced up a little bit, and you think he's got no chance of adjusting well enough to hit this well. But he hit it anyway, and then it was just nestled in the bottom corner. Yes, the, the ball didn't move no. in the air. You could see the sponsor on the ball the whole way. And the goalkeeper didn't move into the back of the net, 
two nil, fantastic. And going in against Liverpool two nil up, and and again you got to remember this is Liverpool who have been playing very well. They've got their star man back Mane, who have been away for fourteen odd days on a uh, warm weather training in La Manga or wherever Marbella or wherever they were. Um, they should have been well up for this after a decent result against Tottenham in the league at home, a very mm. good result. They should have been flying, but I think yes, it was Leicester who pressurised them, who played very well, but I think they also were dreadful on their own performance. And second half, you knew they were going to come back and you knew Leicester would eventually sit deep. I didn't think that they would actually sit back quite so early in the half. Yeah, I, I was a bit worried by that. And I was I was very worried because... I'm glad we didn't do that at 2-0. No, it would have been... Well, they did sit back and Leicester... I thought, hang on. They've had a lot of possession, Liverpool, an awful lot, and it's very easy for them to get forward. Now, we did that last season, towards the end of the season, but it was fine because we were flying by then yeah. and uh, we could do anything we wanted. Well, Liverpool changed their formation at half time as well. They went three at the back. They went three at the back. And they pushed Klein and Milner wider and higher, which meant that they were taking up the. They were occupying the wing, our winger and fullback on each side. Uh, so the likes of Matip playing right centre back and Chan playing left centre back saw a lot of the ball. Now I'm not really bothered that Jean Matip saw a lot of the ball because he's tosh with it, with it, and without it. He's well, he was on Monday night anyway. Very, very strange player. A very he's strange very defender. But well, yeah, yeah, they they saw they had a lot of ball just coming into the Leicester half. But if it's with the centre back, I'm not really that bothered. Not at all. And we managed to get the third goal. A uh, good play down the right hand side by Vardy keeping the team deep cross, and then it was picked up by a combination of Fuchs and Mares, who didn't have the greatest game. Mares, but he he was very calm on the ball when he was given it by Fuchs. He knew exactly what he wanted to do: go down the line, Fuchs. I'll knock it for you. And then a lovely ball in. Fuchs and a header. back onto his right foot, I think. Which yes, he did. A, bought him a, a second. And a lovely pick out by Fuchs, and then a good header by Jamie Vardy, which you don't see often actually. Yeah, and he can score with his head. He scored. I seem to remember a goal against Southampton last season um, with his head. I believe you. Uh, yeah, I think that's right. If you're, not, your your facial expressions yeah. aren't filling me with confidence. I think but, it was Southampton, but, but I can't remember. So, but anyway, uh, a good header, really good header. Three uh, 0 up, game over. And yes, we did sit back then and bring on a lot of pressure. They scored a goal, uh, a good finish. Michael made a couple of good saves, but uh, overall, it wasn't like the Alamo, and they looked quite comfortable. Mm-hmm. And again, a really good rousing reception for the players around the stadium for when they finished and they you, you could tell they really um they really thought it they really they thanked the fans an awful lot because yes they they go and applaud all four corners but this was a bit more than that this was all the players doing it and uh, there was just a, everyone knows what's happened at the club and it was a bit of a look we're still here we look what we can do thanks very much on to the next game yep. let's let's move on which is a strange thing to say about you know what's happened in that, you know, that we just move on straight away. But, but we have to. Oh, yes, exactly. I'm I not saying it's a bad thing. I love the sentiment. I, I love how much the city and the club loves Claudio Ranieri because he deserves all of it, the way he conducted himself, the, the achievements that he managed. But we can't, for the next 12 games, when we've got the uh, the task of preserving our Premier League status, we can't be looking back still and thinking, oh, what about Claudio? What about Claudio? I'm not going to forget what he did ever. It's going to live in my memory forever. It's it's the best time that will ever be for Leicester fans, I think. Oh, yes. And I'll never forget that he was the man, not solely responsible, but he was the man that led the team to that. Exactly. But we can't spend the next 12 games looking over our shoulder going, oh, we sat in Ranieri. We have to go, right, as the fans did on Monday night, back the players, back whoever's in charge, get us out of this I, th- I think we're going to go on a decent run last 12 games and finish mid-table and nobody's going to be bothered. The thing is, the players who played on Monday night and the way they performed, commenting about the players and how well they played, doesn't take anything away from the achievements of last season. So if we go through the players quickly one by one, Schmeichel I thought had a really good game, secure in his hand, did him punch well, saved well. Well, he's um, probably one of the only players that's not been in question this season. Yes. He was awesome against Sevilla. And another person at right back, Danny Simpson, again, another very solid game. And again, another person who has really stood up this season and um, arguably played as well as last season, I would say. Yeah. Uh, the two centre-halves, very good. Again, at home, they play an awful lot better at home than they do away. But um, it was just like last season. They were 
allowing the midfielders to do their job, and we'll come on to the midfielders, one in particular, to do their job in front of them, and they could hold a line on the edge of the box to say, look, if you shoot from that far out, then there's a very good chance that the goalkeeper's going to save it anyway. But we're going to stand here and block, and you try and come through us as a wall. That's what they are. Yeah. If they try to be turned, or if they got to be out, you know, if they're going to be running against an opposition centre forward, that's when we're in trouble. That's when we're exposed. But at home, they can do that. They can set up camp on the edge of the Leicester box, and that's what they did, and that's what they do well, both of them as a pair. And I thought both were exceptional. Yeah, they won, won the headers, won their ground challenges, made a lot of blocks actually. A lot of blocks, which is it has to be an attribute of Wes Morgan. He really does make a lot of blocks. Goes mm. down on one nil knee and uh, and blocks the ball. Same as Robert Huth. And, and again, it was no nonsense defending. And uh, Christian Fuchs at left back, who has been pretty much dreadful since the game <laughs> pretty, against. Uh, pretty much dreadful. Well, yeah, I'm honestly sure that's the right words. But he's been horrendous since Christmas, and I thought he was. Right up there in the man of the match stakes. Yeah, he was brilliant. Yeah, yeah. Again, we know he's got a great left foot, picking out some really good passes. Again, when it came to defending, just got rid of the ball. When he had the ball at his feet, he could actually clear the lines to a man if he needed to. Um, and then, of course, set up the goal well. A lo- some lovely, lovely balls over the top as well. Just a really good all round performance. The midfield, um, Mares was quiet throughout the game. It didn't quite work for him. Again, he's a guy short of confidence. Um, I still would play him against Hull if there's any, you know, just to play well, great. But... He still worked pretty hard, Mares. He, yes. He made up a, f- a few times when the fullback had gone beyond him. I thought, oh, here we go. Mares is just going to trudge back and then uh, and then Simpson's going to be all on his own. I mean, it's always going to be once or twice when he will get caught out for not tracking back as diligently as he, Mark Albright. He worked his socks off, yeah. Mares. Like with the ball at his feet, it didn't really happen for him, but... If it doesn't, it, that's not going to come every game. What can come every game is the work rate and doing the, the and also the, the three, dirty stuff and the three opposition players who come straight to him when he gets the ball. Yeah, um, and of course he set up the goal or set, helped set up Fuchs for the third goal. Yeah, uh, Danny Drinkwater, very industrious in midfield, um, worked very hard. Didn't have the, the the passing as he's had in recent seasons, pretty much, or since the start of the season, this season. Um, no, it was, a, it was a decent performance from him. It wasn't, oh, yes. I think it wasn't a it groundbreaker. Was, but... No, I think it was a bit more industrious. And, of course, the goal to cap it off. Yeah. Wilfred Ndidi. Um, <laughs> he is some player. Some player. We've mentioned before, or I've mentioned especially after two games, and I'm still going to say this, because when he, when he eventually he leaves Leicester for a lot of money, I will turn around and say, I called it after two games. Um that we have got a player here. And that's, it's very easy to say, oh yeah, he's a good player. But I think we still will be lucky to keep hold of him in the summer. And I said that after two games. Um, a hell of a performance. Really good. Again, no no nonsense as well. So when he had the ball and he needed to get rid, he did. Um, just a, do, you know, do you know what? He's like Kante in a way. I don't like to say Kante all the time. But uh, I think now we've got to the point where we've moved on from Kante. So yeah. we're just using him as a baseline. Like people say, the Makaleli role. Yeah. Um, you, you you talk about it as a role rather than just a player. But I think indeed he's got a bit more about him than just that role. Oh, yes. that's. That I was going to say, um, like Kante in a way, he is incredibly honest Yeah. as a footballer. Yeah, yeah. He goes in for the tackle... Honest and true and, and hard into the tackle. If he needs to just agriculturally kick the ball away, he will do. If he can, if he wants to play a pass and the pass is there, he will do. He's good if at he carrying shoot, the ball as well. He can carry, he's tall, he's got them telescopic legs that can reach for the ball. He's got everything to be a top-class midfielder. And he's just turned 20. Some real. Hell of a player. Mark Albright in a great through ball for the goal. Very hard working Unbel- as well. Yeah, unbelievable work rate. And then the two forwards, Okazaki. Again, a lot of just like last season, except basically, yeah. That that performance was last season, I, yeah. And I think Okazaki may have he's he struggled to get in the starting lineup a little bit under under Claudio. I think we missed him. We've mentioned that on the podcast before. He he, along with Kante, were two very key players in terms of the style and the formation that we were attempting to play. Uh, and there was, but there was a lot of pressure on on Ranieri from. I don't know from the owners, but definitely from the fans and from the press. Why aren't you playing Slimani? Why don't you find some way to fit Musa in? Because they were both big money signings in the summer. And Okazaki was the one that suffered, I think, from that. Yeah. But then, to well, a larger extent, the team, the formation, the press all suffered 
because yes, Slomani is a is a very good uh, striker. I'm sure Musa was at CSK in Moscow. Didn't even make the squad for Monday night against Liverpool, by the way. Very telling. Um, yeah, but but Okazaki doesn't need to bring you the goals. Last season proved that he brings you the work rate, the link. And the fact that their midfielders, particularly deep line midfielders, do not get a single second on the ball. Although you do have to say, when he has played this season, he has been poor. That yeah, is yeah but who hasn't? Very true. Very true. I'm not but... saying that he was dropped uh, incorrectly because he was playing well. Mm. And yes, Ranieri was trying to make the changes up there because we don't really have any strength in depth anywhere else. That's to very make, true. To make an important but, change, but, but... He, but he still, even though he was replaced by other players, when he has had a chance, he has been. Poor as well, yeah. but he, but he did play very well at the week. And, and uh, I really think I really rate him as a key part of what we try to do. And then Vardy up top, who ran tirelessly, he could hardly stand up at the end with his interviews. He looked sick. Um, he he probably was at the end because he was he just ran his feet into the ground and he, he jumped very well. Uh, there was there was so much effort there, and I wouldn't just say it was his running, but you, you look how many headers he won in. Mm. I mean, he, he has got a leap on him, and. Um, just a, a very impressive all-round centre forward display by the whole team as well, and it was a great night. It could have just been like last season, and it's put everyone, with, you know, a, a skipping everyone's step this week. I'm pretty sure. Um, yeah, I mean, I've I've only mentioned it might be getting into double figures the amount of time I've only mentioned it to Jamo. Oh, yeah, definitely, definitely. I celebrated the goal literally an, an inch from his face. I come. I was on commentary for the first goal. And the, yeah. the so both Verdi, both Vardy goals I was on commentary for, and I literally shook my fist in celebration about an inch from his face, and he was just he had the other mic headset mic on, and he just said that stayed completely silent. And looked at me and just shook his head. Brilliant. I mean, it's it, it's it's great to beat anyone in the Premier League, which again, as Premier League champion, sounds a weird thing to say, but it's great to beat Liverpool at home. But there was a lot more surrounding the club than just what happened in ninety minutes. Now, of course, everyone, I think, listening to Fox Fox 8 likes uh, one of us to have a bit of a rant. But this... It's usually you. It's normally me. But this could last uh, quite a while, so stand by. Um, Buckle up. Yeah. Rob Hayes, um, do you think that the reaction in the written press by the uh, TV coverage, by the spoken media as well, by social media, which you do have to take a little bit tongue-in-cheek... Um, has been slightly over the top about Ranieri and then how it kind of rolled on from the story of Ranieri to the football club as a whole, to the players, and then on to the owners, and then eventually to the supporters and their reaction. Slightly, yeah. Um, the problem is that most of what's been written or said is by non-Leicester fans or... The Leicester fans or the football fans in general that I struggle to tolerate. Yes. That that find a bandwagon, that read the first thing um, they read in whatever paper or social media site of choice that they see, jump on said bandwagon and then argue their point vociferously. Me and you sit here, we try and take things into account from a wider perspective. We try and look at things subjectively. And we try and digest everything to form our opinion so that we don't sit here and have rants that aren't actually worth anything. Yes. And and, and also, rather than sit here and tell everyone, not what they know, but just go through play by play what happened, we'd like to give our opinion on what happened because at the end of the day, that's, that's what it is. Yeah. That's what podcasts are. It's, it's people's, it's, it, it's our opinion on the events. But, so, Karen. But what we did on episode 60 was we said, yes, thank you very much, Claudia Ranieri. We will love you forever. What you achieved will never be taken away. Sentimentally, it was a difficult um, decision to take. But practically, and results-wise, it was one that the owners, who are businessmen, who have run this club so, so well since they came in, it was one that they pretty much had to make. So we completely see that from their perspective. I think we were completely in the minority, both in amongst Leicester fans and amongst wider football fans. And well, I'm not going to call ourselves football journalists, but but people who comment on public domains on football, 
I think we're in the we were in the minority there because everyone was like, "Oh, it's a scandalous! Look at what he did last season." Yeah, but look at what was happening this season. I I, I agree. I agree completely. Apart from maybe the, the Leicester bit, I think that's strangely. Well, not strangely, but strangely, a lot of people who have been on radios and on TV and in the press, they were surprised, I think, with the amount of Leicester fans who supported the owners and supported the decision, even though they said it was very sad. But there's lots of Leicester fans saying, yes, it was actually the the right thing to do, the correct thing to do. And a lot of people couldn't get their heads around it. Yeah. Um, now, I, I think it's just been a huge disgrace, a massive over-the-top, overblown reaction. It's a big story. You know, the guy who led Leicester 5,000 to 1 to the Premier League has now been sacked the next season. It is, and it was very sad. But the problem is you can't just put thank you, Claudio, as your back page, because that only runs for a day. Exactly. If you turn it into a scandal, it runs for five, six days. The majority of the people who are upset were fans of other clubs. Um, and and I've, you know, I've, I've wrote down one thing, and it was fake outrage. Yeah. And um, and I don't know whether I've, I've read that somewhere, but it was it was in my head. Fake outrage of players. Uh, sorry, well, yeah, players and fans of other clubs, and all these things about snakes and um, snake emojis on people's posts and all that, all by people who don't support Leicester. Maybe the odd one or two, obviously, but it's it, it's just it's very strange that all the phone ins on radio not just sports phone ins football phone ins but during the day all dominated by the story and people could not get their head round what had happened and they're all like you said people who are not associated with the club who are these owners uh, football clubs are run by mercenaries nowadays without any knowledge about who they are also we're saying this on the day that our financial results have been published and Leicester made a profit of what 16 odd million quid um which was about 10 million down on the year before um now on those financial results there is a big star at the bottom and the big star says 2 million of this went to the children's charities local children's charities so as I've had a few people turn around to me and says your owners are mercenaries they're only in it for the money and I've just turned around and says you have no idea what you're talking about no but Obviously, they're in to make a bit of money with King Power, and they've done very well out well, of the of club. Of course, but yeah. but then they're not here to do it for free. I've told them they've I've very told quickly them, grown to love the club, haven't they? Oh yes, not in the area. And I've told them you do realise they donated two million pounds to local children's charities. That's not. Did you, you, did you know Claudio donated half of his payoff fee to that as well? Uh, apparently, that's was been that not true? Un, unproven. That was a, a story that got um, wouldn't surprise quickly me passed round, um, and it was. Proved unproven. I don't know what we'll whether we'll find can, out can something. You, can you prove something unproven? It was proved to be unproven. <laughs> That's a good point. Yeah, proved to be unproven. It wouldn't surprise me though. But, oh yes, but, definitely. But, but and, he and, he bought into the. He very quickly learned to love the club and the city he, as well, didn't he? But, I said like, on the last the point episode, we're making is that the, the, the owners have done that from day one. They have. They've understood the club and the supporters, the size of the club and what it needs and how it needs to be ran, and also what supporters like. And they've got Susan Willingham as the chief exec from, from the start, and they quickly understood what football fans like. And it might sound, it, we're, we're not stupid, but if I go to the game and they turn around and said, oh, by the way, you can have a couple of bottles of beer for free, thank you very much. Or I go to an away game, by the way, you get a pint and a pie for free. Oh, thank you very much. Towards the end of the season, by the way, we're playing away at Sunderland, you can have free travel and a pint. It's li- little things. Mm. And, oh, but, and you get a scarf as well. Well, thank you very much. I'm going to support the team anyway, but these little things go far. And... Also, you know, the clappers, I know a lot of people don't like them, but they're there. They cost, I think we tipped over the amount that we paid for Riyad Mahrez with the amount we spent on the yeah. clappers. But the one thing I, I love about the whole situation, everyone, the media, fans of other clubs especially, fans of certain clubs especially, they all thought that the game on Monday was going to turn into a horrible really unsavoury mess because of what happened last year at Chelsea. When they sacked Mourinho, because they were pr- they were very poor in the league and the players had pretty much down tools. Now, I'm not saying that's what's happened at Leicester, but there are big echoes There, there were some similarities, weren't okay. there? And what happened? The fans turned on the players and turned on the club and it was a real mess. Now, of course, obviously... Typical football, as soon as everything's fine again, then, you know, everything's smelling rosy in the garden and they're going to win the league this year. But what happened at Leicester? 
nothing of the such. There were reporters from newspapers, from radio and TV, going around Leicester. There were bookmakers. Mate, there wasn't with, a seat to be had in the press box. There were it book, was packed. There were bookmakers with hearses outside the ground saying, football is dead. Yeah. There was a, a little lad who organised a march from the clock tower to the ground to show not only, not support for any area, but to thank him. And... Um, People turned up from the written press and the media to report on it, and they said, look at this protest about the owners. And quickly they turned around and said, no, you do realise it's a little lad who's organised the march. They expected banners around the ground saying, King Power out and get rid of our owners. No, it was all thank you, Claudio. Yep. And grazie, Claudio, by the, um, in SK1, by the, uh, the Foss boys in the corner. Um, fantastic. Absolutely brilliant. And then as soon as the game started... Players 100% commitment and the fans 100% commitment behind. We support the club. We don't support we individuals. We do when they're part of the club, obviously. But we support Leicester. Craig Shakespeare's Blue and White Army was sung. Exactly. There were no Ranieri songs until the 65th minute. And then when it came round, the 65th minute, the age amazing. of Ranieri, it was amazing. The the lights around the ground, the noise, and again, keeping an eye on the old social media. A lot of people were expecting all sorts before the game and you could see all of a sudden the tide had turned and they went, hang on, this is not happening. It's not happening. What we th- Where are the protests? The only protests are being made by bookmakers outside the ground. Yeah. The only protests march that we've seen actually were organised support for Ranieri and organised thank you Ranieri by a 10-year-old lad. And the only signs that we've seen have been in thank you of Claudio and a huge grazie Claudio sign in the far corner. And then the big organised thank you Claudio 65th minute lights, all of a sudden everyone went, hang on, this club's different. We're mm. not a Chelsea who have just turned on the club. We actually support the club and we've thanked Claudio and we've moved on because unfortunately in football, it's day to day, it moves on straight away. It's all about the present rather than the past. You can you can remember the past, obviously, and you we'll have... Or you we'll can have, be like a forest fan and cling on to former glory. Exactly. You've got to look forward, you've got to stick to the present, and then with the past, you remember the good times, you'll have a... There'll be a statue and everything, and, you know, no one will forget what happened with Claudio last year. Of course. But how could you ever? Now, all of a sudden, a couple of days later, what's happening? You read the papers, and it's all... Oh, it turns out that all the outrage was by other people, not Leicester fans. It's brilliant. It just shows you that the tides turn. And to be honest, I have mentioned many times and I've about the club this year and last season of how how fantastic our club and how proud I am of Leicester. You know, mm-hmm. the, the the fans, the club, the decisions they've made, the, the city as a whole, the city as a whole, the way that they responded to the Premier League win was brilliant. The parade and all that, it was superb. And I think the way Leicester, as a city and as fans, you're always going to have one or two who who are going to try and you know upset the apple Absolutely fine, no problem. But uh, the way that I think Leicester as a club and as a city and as fans especially have reacted to Claudio, Claudio Ranieri being sacked, I think it's been brilliant. Mm. And, um, and long may it continue. Now, was that a rant? That was that was fairly positive for you. Most of your most of your rants are very 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 negative. That was you managed to spin that with a with a positive twist at the end. Well, it was negative towards other people, but positive towards the club, which is always the best way. Of course, thank you, Peter Selby. Uh, let's look forward then to Saturday. It's it's a big game. I, I think you could have probably written Monday off as not expecting any points. Uh, be interesting to see how the crowd reacts, etc., etc. This is actually a big game on the football pitch because Hull are right down there with us. They've had a little bit of an upturn in fortune since uh, since Silver took over as their manager. The bit of the the new manager syndrome, if you like. But it's not just three points. It's the old cliched six pointer because of the gap that it allows you to build. The fact that you can prevent your rivals from getting three points, and also it enables you to find your level. Like how a Leicester are going to perform against Hull City, who I would consider, at the start of the season at least, to be the worst team in the Premier League, who beat us on the opening day. It's. I think this is a much more important game than Monday. Is this the same Hull City who are all snakes because they've started to play well because they've got a new manager? No, they're not. <laughs> it's not that's not how it works. I, I know it's not how it works, but... 
because yeah. Mike Phelan didn't win the Premier League. Exactly. But you can see where Uncle, you know. Yeah. It's, it, anyway, so enough of that. The approach, um, the approach on Saturday, I think it's brilliant that we've got another home game straight away. Oh, I yes. Think, I think it enables us to build some momentum. I think six points, a rocking atmosphere again at the King Power Stadium and some confidence reinstalled into the players, I think is massive. If we'd have gone away to Hull, I think it would have been a much more difficult uh, encounter. Definitely. But I'd say play at home, put the same 11 players out. Yep. Off you go. Same game plan. Go and hammer them. Completely agree. Um, you're playing a whole team who, like you said, have been playing well recently since they brought the new guy in, who has to be, um, even if he takes them down, a possibility for the Leicester job maybe in the summer. Um, by all the reports from Hull, he's been very, very good, uh, like behind the scenes as well. They do. Play the same team, play the same intensity. Um, the crowd on Saturday will be well up for it. Yep. Um, if you remember towards the end of last season, the atmosphere in the ground whilst the teams were warming up was 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 unreal. Mm-hmm. It, you could sense it and you could hear it in places. And of course, against um, you know the last few games, they were, it was unbelievable. There'll it, be there'll be a buzz of there will be a real real buzz on Saturday. And if we score early, then we, it could be the same way as on Monday. Yeah. We could go one, two, three. Now, of course, we're not saying that for granted, but um, I expect a victory. Yeah, I really do. I yeah. hope and I expect for a victory. Um, even a draw wouldn't be the worst result in the world, but I expect Leicester to go at Hull and get a victory. Now, as Leicester fans know, we've got a decent run of games, especially at home. We've got Bournemouth still to play at home. We've got, obviously, Hull on Saturday. We've got Stoke still to turn up at the King Power off the top of my head. Um, and yeah, we've, got, we've got a decent run of games. Um, so just getting this extra win, just to get us clear, which, of course, we always said through, you know, under Claudio, just two wins on the bounce and we'll be far, you know, quite far clear of the zone, you know, mm. five points at this time of the season is still quite a decent gap. There's teams falling down the league like Leicester were, uh, such as Bo- uh, Bournemouth, who are getting sucked in. So I expect us to go hard at Hull on Saturday with a rousing King Power crowd behind him, get the early goal, same team as on Saturday. Interesting that Craig Shakespeare, um, at the end of the game on Monday, he was asked whether Leonardo Ajoa and Slomani would be uh, not only fit because they're on the bench, but match fit for Saturday. And straight away went, yep, no no rubbish, no hiding behind anything. No. And uh, considering if we do win the game, then we could be above Bournemouth up into 14th place. 14th, yeah. um, the dizzy heights of 14th. The dizzy heights of 14th. So that's on Saturday. And then we've got a big gap until the game against Seville. Now, obviously, our next podcast will be some time after the Hall game before the game against Seville. Now, who knows what could happen in between that. Uh, Now, we've had a bit of a social media push online. So if you're listening to the podcast for the first time, then please follow us on Twitter at FFSpod. So for Fox 8 Pod, that's what it stands for, obviously. Um, Did quite well with that, didn't we? Thank you very much. Um, And then obviously you can follow us on Facebook as well. Just follow us at uh, for Fox 8. Just type that in and you can click like and you can listen to the podcasts on there. If you go to the YouTube channel, type in Fox 8 Podcast on YouTube and you'll find the YouTube channel. Uh, We're pretty much up to date on there. You can find the whole back catalogue. Uh, so you got all last season's ones, ones we did on the parade and all sorts. You lucky things. Exactly. Now, SoundCloud's where to go to get them initially. That's where they go instantly. Straight away. So if, you, if you're if you on SoundCloud, you can listen completely for free. You can do that on your phone, yeah. on, if on you a follow, laptop. If you follow the podcast, I think you get a notification to say that we've put a new episode up, etc. So. The best way to follow, though, in my opinion, is not only through social media, but if you do have an iPhone or if you listen online uh, through your laptop, then it's through iTunes. So on your iPhone or any other phone you have, you can uh, go to your podcast uh, app, ideally the iTunes one, and subscribe completely for free. And as soon as the podcast drops, that's what the kids say. As soon as it drops. As soon as it you drops. Do the little, oh, yeah, yeah, a little, the little hand, action. hand action. version, like the, the, the octopus type. We, we will start vlogging one day. Boom, not that. Possibly. Um, possibly I've looked into um, Facebook Live. Everyone's Facebook Live in things now. Yeah. And there's a danger if we do Facebook Live, though. Could what? Who people, knows what you're going to say next? Well, there's that. And also, people will People see don't realise this takes me 48 hours to edit it because I have to listen to every single word you've said and censor it. I don't, I don't swear. I know. 
We actually made a point of that before we started to say that it's not going to be full of swearing because I so, think if so we you did let the kids listen exactly. But also, if we started, we wouldn't stop. This is also very true. That's true. Uh, but and we've a... only ever done one podcast intoxicated as well, haven't we? Which I think has served as well. That was the Christmas do. Yeah, yeah. That was uh, that was that, with, was that was with Bobby, the boring United fan. Yes, we, we just after we beat Man U. Yeah. Uh, no, when no. we drew, when Vardy uh, broke the record. That's right, the 1-1, yeah. one, one, and we yeah. did it at the, uh, the Alamark Sport Christmas party. <laughs> My word. Um, so, yes, that's the way so to So most follow. of the time we're sober, and most of the time we don't swear. Yeah, we do have a TV on, and Vardy just scored against Liverpool. Look at that. That was a good goal, wasn't it? Um, now, just a few messages via social media, just to pick out one or two. Like I said, we've had a bit of a push on, so uh, if you could do us the honours of uh, oh, following on. us have a little follow. at FFS Pod and maybe retweeting um, when we put out the podcast on there, that will be great. Uh, we're just going through a few In over fact, the next few do, days. do it now for us. We- Open a new tab on your laptop. That's begging. I'm just asking nicely. I, I, I'm, yeah, I got in. I was requesting just, you know, if, if it was a favour. Now. now. Yeah, do it. <laughs> do it. <laughs> we'll know who doesn't. Yes. Well, what's wrong with you? What are you doing? Stop <laughs> listening and retweet us and then but go back and listen. Right. But we do like to read what you've put and Pete's going to read some out now, I think. Yes. I'm just going to go through one or two and it's over the last few days. Uh, James Curran with an interesting tweet saying, with Enrique leaving Barca at the end of the season... Can we get Hodgson for Barcelona trending? <laughs> now, straight away, my first reaction to that was, as I got halfway through the tweet, was, sure, is he saying about Enrique for Leicester? Well, I think he's mainly <laughs> trying to make sure that Hodgson doesn't come to Leicester. That's how I'd read into that. We'll, we'll just mention Hodgson at the end. Uh, Packer Ken's been in contact. He says he's tired of all the players getting called snakes with every single post that they make on social media. I completely agree, but if you do look at the clubs that the fans support who put them on, not only players, but players' wives' Twitter feeds, they're all from clubs elsewhere, not Leicester. They're yeah. all fans of other clubs. Also, if you've got a minute or two spare... Go and look at Danny Simpson versus Jamie Carragher's Twitter spat. That, How good was that? That's blown up, hasn't it? That has. Just a touch. Um, also... Come back um, to me when you've won a Premier League title, Cara. Yeah. <laughs> Why aren't players putting their thanks to Claudio? It's called a social media blackout whilst the dust settles for 24 hours. Yeah. And then everyone... And they all it. spoke to him at the training ground in person it's before amazing, putting it? anything online. You didn't put anything online within five minutes. You hate him. It's stupid, isn't it? Uh, our friends at the cop table, hello. Also, our friends at the Anfield Wrap, hello. Did you enjoy Monday? So we've had a bit of a, a note from then. Um, it's interesting from Billy Bilson, who said what we said at the start of the show. People who think uh, we'd turn on our owners know nothing about the club, uh, which I think we well covered said, as well. Uh, yep, just scrolling through a few more. Uh, well, I asked whether people should be surprised at the starting lineup, and uh, and they turned around and went, nope, not at all. It's what we should uh, have done. Uh, a lot of people were reacting to a few of the posts that we put from the players. So Mark Albrighton's statement was, of course, very poignant because of what's happened with him and his private life with uh, with his family. Um, and he put a very heartfelt thank you to Claudio, which I think all of them have. Mm-hmm. And I thought uh, Vardy's was good as well by basically saying he didn't quite know what to write because of what you know what's happened last season. Um, there was a few rumours regarding the uh, the payoff for Claudio and going to charity, uh, and that's been unsubstantiated. And um, and another one by Elite Products. So hello to Elite Products, whatever they do. And it's interesting how many people know so much about our club and haven't seen a minute of any game this season. And I think that's a great way to end because mm. the people who know best are the fans of the club. Now, we get to see an awful lot of football at Leicester, so we comment on what we see. And it seems to me that the people who talk in the most sense are the fans out there who go every week. Or, if they can't go every week because either they are uh, living abroad or because they can't get to the game through one way or another or, or it's because it's sold out, but they follow the club closely, it seems to me that in all what's happened over the last seven days, they are the people who have been talking the most sense. 